almost all flights end safely and routinely. But on rare occasion, a flight ends in tragedy. It is vitally important that we determine the precise cause of an accident and understand just why it occurred. This is because those who do not learn the lessons of history, as the saying goes, are destined to repeat it. Accident investigation is a complex science that places the history of a fatal flight under microscopic examination. Trained investigators can spend months of painstaking effort trying to fit all of the puzzle pieces together. But every once in a while, the puzzle is never solved because all of the pieces can't be found. But with respect to airline accidents, there seldom are any missing pieces. That's because these aircraft are equipped with two kinds of recorders that usually answer most of the questions. These are what newspaper and television reporters commonly refer to as the black boxes. We're here at the Lockheed Aircraft Service Company in Upland, California. Now Lockheed has been manufacturing flight data recorders since 1958. And as you can see, they're not black, they're orange. Bright international orange, which makes them much easier to find in the wreckage. And they're almost always placed in the tail because this part of an airplane is the least susceptible to damage. Now this recorder, for example, survived in the tail of a Boeing 720 that was intentionally demolished and consumed by fire during an FAA crash test in 1985. Now this has led some people to conclude that the tail of an aircraft also is the safest place for the passengers. And I think that accident statistics probably bear this out. The purpose of a flight data recorder is to record various parameters of flight. Now the most common such recorders etch flight data on a strip of aluminum foil. The results look something like the traces made on a bar graph or a seismograph. Now as you can see, five parameters of flight are recorded. These are aircraft heading, indicated airspeed, altitude, g-load, and time. And this is a graphical representation of the etched data. Digital flight data recorders, however, are much more sophisticated. They record hundreds of parameters on magnetic tape that tells you almost everything you'd ever want to know about the history of a flight. For example, data from a digital recorder can be reproduced in tabular form, like these, or in the form of graphs like these. The recorded data might include control surface positions, pitch and roll angles, engine indications, switch positions, system status, and almost anything else you can imagine. Rumor even has it that some of these recorders can tell you not only when the captain ate his crew meal, but what he had for dinner as well. With such an abundance of information, Investigators have very little trouble recreating the history of a flight. The trouble is that not very many aircraft are equipped with such elaborate recorders. The cockpit voice recorder is another tool that provides invaluable information during an investigation. It is also somewhat controversial. This is because the government has allowed the public to hear private cockpit conversations that have had no bearing on an accident in question. The microphone for the voice recorder is usually on the overhead panel. In addition to recording all cockpit conversation, it also tapes other sounds of use to investigators. These include switches being moved, systems being activated, oral warnings, and other noises that might provide important clues. You'll notice that the recorder has an erase button. This allows a pilot to erase the tape once the aircraft is on the ground and the parking brake has been set. This prevents someone from eavesdropping in on a private conversation that might have occurred during a routine flight. The FAA also does its share of recording outside the aircraft. As you probably know, all traffic control communications between pilots and controllers are recorded on magnetic tape and saved for 15 days. But if there's an accident or if a pilot violates a regulation, the tape is preserved as evidence. 
Now here's a recording that I think you're going to find of interest. It involves a pilot having a rather unusual problem. Let's listen to a short excerpt. If you want to obtain, for any reason, a recording of communications between you and any ATC facility, simply send a written request to the appropriate FAA regional headquarters. By the way, all telephone briefings obtained from a flight service station also are recorded. Another investigative tool is the ATC radar tape. Now you may not realize it, but every time your transponder is interrogated by a radar facility, your transponder's reply is recorded and saved for 15 days. In other words, your position and altitude, assuming that you have mode C, is recorded for posterity every four to five seconds when being tracked by a terminal radar system or every six to 12 seconds when being tracked by center radar. The tape recording of these radar hits can be played back on a radar screen so that investigators can duplicate exactly what was on a controller's radar screen prior to and at the time of the incident. This, for example, is a video playback of the radar recording made during the infamous mid-air collision over Cerritos, California. Notice the disappearance of the Aeromexico DC-9. Carbon 6 6 Romeo, stand by. Aero Mexico 498, turn left heading 280, over. So, Aero Mexico 498, Los Angeles approach. Recorded radar hits also can be listed on a tabular printout that shows aircraft position and altitude at frequent time intervals. Now, this information can then be used to plot the track of an aircraft on a topographical chart. This chart, for example, was prepared here at Aviation Systems Associates of Rolling Hills Estates in Southern California. It shows the tracks of two aircraft, a Cessna 210 and a Beechcraft King Air that were involved in a mid-air collision near John Wayne Airport in Santa Ana, California. This represents the point over which the mid-air collision occurred. Once these radar hits are plotted, you can measure the distance between hits and compute ground speed. And by applying winds aloft, it's just as easy to determine what the true airspeed was at any given point along the track. The process of accident investigation involves collecting this and all sorts of other data. Only then can the investigators reach a conclusion and establish a probable cause. On occasion, Data can be used to create a computer simulation of the events leading up to an accident. The simulation can be so dramatic and so lifelike that watching it almost makes you feel as though you're flying in formation with the ill-fated aircraft. An excellent example of such a computer simulation was prepared by Z-Axis, Infinite Imagery of Aurora, Colorado. The accident involved a Lockheed 1011 TriStar that was flown through a microburst and crashed while approaching runway 17 left at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport on August the 2nd, 1985. The first piece of videotape that you're about to see was prepared using recorded radar data and an assortment of weather data. It is sped up quite a bit and shows the aircraft approaching the airport from the east. 
You can see that altitudes are shown in one minute intervals. The white and gray blobs represent rain showers. Now the most intense of these, the one spawning the microburst responsible for the accident is over the final approach course to the runway. If you look carefully, you can see the thunderstorms growing as the aircraft progresses toward the airport. This next segment was reconstructed from available weather data and shows a sped up version of what the pilots might have been able to see on their radar during their left turn onto final approach. The cell closest to the nose is the one containing the destructive microburst. You're about to see a very dramatic view of the aircraft during its last two minutes of flight. Now remember, this was created using mountains of information from a very sophisticated digital flight data recorder. It shows the exact movements of the aircraft prior to impact. You can hear ATC communications and the various sounds picked up by the cockpit voice recorder. The dark cylinder through which the aircraft flies is the rain shaft containing the microburst. And now for a profile view that shows aircraft altitude and its position relative to the glide slope. It is particularly fascinating because it shows, among other things, the behavior of the wind, which you can see in the form of a wind vector in the lower left corner of your screen. Now notice that the aircraft was in calm air prior to reaching the microburst, but as Flight 191 entered the microburst, you'll notice that it encountered a strong headwind that eventually and suddenly shifted into an even stronger tailwind. Now this resulted in a net change in wind velocity of 70 knots. Now that's an extraordinary wind shear. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. That's it. We can read about the causes of various accidents, and many of us will learn from such lessons. But I think you'll agree that computer simulation provides an even greater learning experience. It almost allows us to share in the experience of the trauma without having to suffer the ultimate consequence. Let's work to make sure that none of our flights ever become similar object lessons. <laughs>